I get started now. I just push the record button. Well, welcome everyone and good evening and welcome to the Comboating Winter Adventure Series and tonight's presentation with Art Payne titled Boats Light Up My Life. I'm Brenda Harrington, the program librarian at the Belfast Free Library. And we are pleased to continue to co-sponsor the Winter Adventure Series with Comboating and glad we can do so remotely. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The program is being recorded and will be available soon at the Belfast Free Library website. And as I said before, please, I'm gonna remind you again to please keep your mics muted. There will be a Q&A after the presentation. And so please type your questions into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Next, I would like to turn the mic over to Carol Kuhn from Comboating for updates and to introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, Carol, I'll take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I hope you can all hear me. On behalf of Comboating, I wanna thank Brenda Harrington, Director of Adult Programs and the Belfast Free Library for co-sponsoring another Comboating Winter Adventure Series. This year is unlike Comboating Winter Series of past years, when sometimes 150 people would be in the Abbott room with standing room only and making Brenda feel very apprehensive and very conscious of the fire re code restrictions. So there's something good that virtual can do. There can even be more of us, I guess, because we don't know that's gonna happen again. And Brenda and the library's help is really appreciated as Brenda helps coordinate our presentations. She does the press releases, she makes posters and she troubleshoots video tech issues in case presenters have that kind of problem. So thank you so much, Brenda, for all your help. I also want to thank Nikki Green of Comboating. She's recruited the presenters and organized the three presentations of this year's virtual winter series. Nikki and Sam are really good friends with Art Payne and his wife, Carrie Dunavid. Nikki is shyer than I am, and so she's not in front of the camera tonight. Thank you, Mickey. And I wanna tell you a little bit about Comboating, then I'll announce the, the next and last presentation of your series. And then I will let Art Payne introduce himself as he is a colorful raconteur and I would do him a disservice with a thoughtful, well-prepared introduction. So um, Comboating, well, we're an all volunteer organization which started around the year 2000. We're dedicated to bring people together to enjoy and celebrate, celebrate boating in our beautiful Belfast Harbor and on the Passagasawasa Key River known as the Passy. Um, and we, we know no matter what your level, skill level is or your experience, Comboating offers boating opportunities for fun, for exercise and for learning. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization and donations are welcome. So check out our Comboating website. So we're really missing our in-person activities, rowing in the winter, in the spring, and community rows in the summer and fall with new and veteran rowers. We miss the challenge of the New England gig races where our Belfast Comboating teams excel and the hosting of our August, August Comboating Regatta as part of the Harbor Heritage Weekend. We miss the boost that we um, Comboating veterans get from watching and rowing with and marveling at the enthusiasm of the Comboating youth team. They know how to win their regattas and how to have fun. And yes, they make us feel young and old at the same time. So thank you, Comboating Youth Rowers. We look forward to a time when we can all be rowing together again and hang out at our new floating docks and at the Comboating Shed at the picnic table. Our community spirit, our all inclusiveness and embracing of all things nautical are really needed now more than ever before. However, we, we still have costs maintaining the three Cornish gigs and one four person gig and two trailers. Our big cost in 2020 was the new floating docks and we appreciated all the donations for this project. Insurance for the gigs and trailers costs about $3,000 a year. And every year there are also significant maintenance costs of the gigs by Comboating volunteers helping with the maintenance. So please consider donating to Comboating. All things COVID really impacted Comboating. Besides stopping our rows, our membership dropped drastically. After March 2020, we had about 25 Comboating memberships for all of 2020. In 2019, we had about 125 members. So we are actively requesting renewal of your Comboating membership or becoming a new member. It's a whopping $25 a year for an individual and 45 for family. So if you're not able to make a larger donation, just consider a new or renewed Comboating membership as a show of support for Comboating. 
We had an uptick in donations and membership after our January presentation, which was with Greg Welch of the Maine Island Trail Association. So thank you, thank all of you. Um, the next Cambodian um, Winter Series is the presentation. It, it's a month from now on Tuesday, March 9th, and it's Cambodian's own Lee Dorsey and Damian Colbury. So they will give a slideshow of their Rowing to Wild about their 2018 10-day row of the entire coast of Maine. And many of you will remember their January 2020 presentation of the R2AK, the Race to uh, um, Alaska. And that's the North America's longest human and wind-powered race. And they were the only in the spring of 2014 in Port Washington to kick. Introduction. You will arts presentation from 2017, the building of the Dory Rose. I just want this not about he and his identical twin brother Chuck starting out painting and drawing on shirt cardboards donated by residents on Jamestown, Rhode Island, where Art and I both have family members and mine are zooming in to watch tonight, then I will have to interrupt Art and I'll have to tell that story myself. So let's welcome Art. Thank you. Well, thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Carol. And I got intending to talk about the shirt cardboards. Uh, well, you better. I'm very concerned that this could run long, and so I had to cut that out of there. But you can, if you want to do another story, you can tell about that. Um, I, I think I'll just start right off and say that, as many of you know, that know me, as far back as I can remember, <clears throat> I've always been in love with boats. And as far back as I remember, I've also considered myself extremely lucky. And I think my first bit of luck in life was the fact that when I was born, I wasn't alone. There was this other person there. I was born an identical twin. And that was ended up being one of the luckiest things that ever happened in my life. Because my twin and I always loved each other. We were very simpatico. We, we liked all of the same things. And we were very much an enhancement to each other's life. Now, of course, I have to push the button and hope it actually works. Bear with me. If this works, it's all going to work. Oh, it worked. Thank God. Okay, so who are those two little darlings? We don't even know which one is which, but one of them is Chuck and one of them is Art. And one of the luckiest things of, among many lucky things that happened in our lives is that we grew up on an island. And it was the island that Carol was talking about called Jamestown in the middle of Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. And as fortune would have it, it's obviously it's surrounded by water, but it, served, it was served by ferry boats and it's right near Newport, Rhode Island. In fact, the ferry boats go over and back between Jamestown and Newport. And as people may know, Newport was somewhat of a yachting capital, maybe considered the yachting capital of the world. There were yachts everywhere, but not only were the yachts, this is what we saw growing up on Jamestown almost every day, at least in the summertime. The, the bay was, this is only, what, 1948, it says on that. This is only a few years after the war ended, and people took to yachting in a big way. So we saw sailboats every day, and we saw ferry boats. We heard the ferry boats tooting their horns. They came and went every half hour to Newport. And so we fell in love with ferry boats. And then the third contingent was the naval vessels. Because after World War II, many, many ships came back from war and Newport was a major Navy base. And so we were just surrounded by boats and we found them, them really fascinating. My, we lived in that little shack. In fact, my family called this building the shack. They were very proud of it. My mother wasn't all that pleased to come back from California and have to live in the shack. As far as my brother and I were concerned, we had landed smack dab in paradise. I could go on and on, but they're saying I can't. My father was away a lot. My mother lived somewhat like a single mother because my dad seemed to be always off either working or looking for work. And that left her and us on the island together. But we were anything but alone. 
he, they say it takes a village to raise a child. And we lived in the village of Jamestown and everyone was nurturing. We had so many people pulling for us. And the major one in our lives with my dad away was my grandfather, Arthur S. Clark. And he was, he was a big deal on the island. He was a blue collar worker, he was a plumber, but he did a great many other things. He was an inventor, he dabbled in real estate, he was the chief of the fire department 50 years, he was caretaker, he was a boat captain, and that interested us because anything that had boat in it was of interest to us. He was a, a big fish in a little pond. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, excuse me. Mention of the word fish. I almost forgot. The fish, this, my grandfather had the record for the biggest striped bass ever caught in the world and he held that record for 50 years. And he caught it on an eel law that he invented and got a patent on and he sold them everywhere. So my grandfather was really a, a marvelous guy. And as I said, he was a caretaker. We had mansions on Jamestown and still do, uh, just like Newport did. And all of the people that owned those mansions or most of them had docks and they had boats and they had rowboats, they had captains. They were big into the boating world. And at that time of life, boats weren't ugly. Boats were always really, really pretty. There was a, a rating rule called the CCA rule, which determined that yawls were what you wanted to have. And a yawl was like this boat you see here. It had a big mast up front and a teeny little one back aft. And the shear lines, most of you know what the shear line is, was absolutely beautiful. All these boats were, were built out of wood. Fiberglass hadn't been invented yet. And most of them were Harrishoff designs, at least on Jamestown. This is not a Harrishoff design, but they all had white top sides. They all had, most of them had green bottoms. Uh, I mean, Nat Harrishoff said only a damn fool would paint his boat any other color but white. And uh, my brother and I were just besotted with boats and studied them. And we had the advantage that my, my grandfather would allow us to go. He had the keys because he was caretaker to go into the boat houses owned by some of the Philadelphians that owned the magnificent mansion. And we would go into those boat houses, he'd let us in and we would stroke the Harrishoff boats and we would look at them and we would, we would critique we had the audacity at age four to critique Nathaniel Harrishaw, okay? We were a little bit big for our britches, I guess. Anyway, um, we, we loved boats, and, but my mother didn't. My mother, whom we lived with, um, she was afraid of boats. She was afraid of the sea, and that was because previous to World War II, many of her boyfriends went off to sea in the Pacific and never came back. And, and my grandfather, as I said, was a surf caster, surf casting for bass and, stri and uh, stripers and uh, bluefish. And one night, four of his friends went fishing on Bull Rock, which is right down the, the cliff from Horsehead Mansion. And a big wave came along and swept them all away, and three of them drowned. And so my mother did not feature the sea for her boys. She was very concerned about the two of us for several reasons. One is she, she used to say, you boys were born with a one track mind. She thought we were pretty narrow, okay? And that, that concerned her. But the other thing, since she was a, a very kind, very sympathetic woman, she was concerned that we were getting our hopes up. She, she used to say, you know, boys, we're not really, <laughs> We're not living high off the hog, and, and I don't know if you'll ever be able to even step foot in a yacht. So you don't want to get your, your sights set too high. But we did set our sights high. And we told her, Mom, well, that's okay. We know we can't own a boat, but we may never own a boat. We may, may never be invited on a boat like that. But we, we found a way to get around it. This kind of gets into the shirt card boards, but I'm not going to go there. We, we knew that we could draw them. And, and we drew boats, couldn't have a rowboat, we would draw rowboats. And it was almost as good. We could imagine ourselves in there and the creaking of the oars and the water when we bailed drizzling all over us. It was enough to, to just draw boats. And uh, one thing about twins, in particular identical twins, 
in especially particular these two identical twins, me and Chuck, was they tend to compete against each other. I mean, when we skipped rocks down on the beach, we'd count how many skips and he'd have more skips than me and I'd have to practice and practice and have more skips than him. And we were that way about drawing. We would look at each other's drawing. We'd be sitting on the rug in the shack, leaned against Pops, our big dog, and he'd be sleeping and farting. And we would just sit there and draw, but we'd look at each other's and we'd try to draw better than the other one. And each trying to do better than the other, we got really good at drawing. And we were supported by the whole island. People treated my mother like a single mother and didn't think that we had that much. My brother and I thought we were the richest people on the face of the earth. We had everything we wanted and more. The whole island supported us. So every once in a while we'd go, and they all knew we were crazy about boats. So we'd go out of the shack and we'd come around the front of the shack and there'd be a cardboard box there and it would be filled with books books about boats, old tattered books, we didn't care, piloting seamanship and small boat handling, Skeen's Elements of Yacht Design, Yacht Designing and Planning, all these books by H.A. Callahan, that only old people like me even remember H.A. Callahan, and we devoured them. And to the point where by the time we were seven or eight years old, we knew all the sails on a, on a square rigged ship. And uh, of course we drew what we saw. We were crazed about the ferry boats. We loved to hear their horns tooting. Uh, we were so cute, of course, we're still cute, as you can see. Um, but we were so cute that the ferry boat captains would let us go out into the, up into the pilot house, just special for us, and hold on to the big wheel. We knew them all by name, all the ferry boat captains. Hold on to the big wheel and turn it and diddle with the engine order telegraph and there was a speaking tube, all polished brass, where they spoke down into the engine room and said, you're gonna give me some more, give me some more. And they lift us up and let us blow into the speaking tube. The whole island was kind to us and supportive. So we were, like they say, it takes a village to raise a child and we were being well raised. One bellwether moment in our life, once we could read and write, uh, was my mother took us to the library Oh, Brenda, you're gonna love this. Um, took us to the library and we, we went into the, we went into the um, library. Oh yeah, let's catch up here. Went into the library and the librarian introduced us to the concept of a magazine. And of course, the first thing we said, we understood what magazines were. We'd seen life and looked. And she said, did you know there's magazines and they're about nothing but boats? And we didn't really know that. And so we took home every month's issue of yachting, motorboating and skipper magazine. And back in those days, those three magazines understood the connection of aesthetics and yachting. They were beautiful magazines. They would have custom done paintings on the cover, all three of those magazines. Yachting magazine had that beautiful logo at the top Chuck and I were very critical when they changed that logo. It was the biggest mistake Yachting Magazine ever made. You couldn't have a better yoga logo than that one. But the key, chief thing we were interested in was about halfway through the magazine would be the design section. And we would go in there and devour that design section where the designers would show off their wares. And we're talking designers that like uh, Harrishoff, of course, and John Ald and, and Starling Burgess and Phil Rhodes and Augie Nielsen and Spell and Sparkman and Stevens, the masters. And uh, we just, we loved the magazines and we loved the drawings. Uh, we loved looking at Alliance drawing. And I think by the time we were eight years old, we certainly understood what was going on with them, but we didn't have the tools. Uh, we didn't have ducks and splines and French curves, oh, we wanted French curves so bad. And a planimeter, oh my God, it was probably 15 years before either one of us ever owned a planimeter. Um, but we understood what was going on. At one point, actually in one of those books they left in front of the shack, it was Yacht Designing and Planning by Howard I. Chappelle. He was mostly a yachting historian, but he really could fare a set of lines. And he did some design on his own. For instance, this drawing right here, this is a Chappelle drawing. And it, he, it looks a lot like a Gil Smith cat boat from Great South Bay, Long Island, but it isn't because it's got a keel on it. 
And as far as I know, he's one of the first designers who ever tried to put a keel on a cat boat. And he drew this boat, and this was 70 years ago. And I looked at that drawing and I said, other than the fact the line weights don't vary too much, that was the prettiest lines plan I'd ever seen in my life. So I thought I would give you folks the opportunity of seeing the world's prettiest line plan. Um, that's something that interested my brother and I a whole heck of a lot. And of course we tried. <laughs> This is on a, oh, Carol, this is on a shirt cardboard. Um, this is done with the ink. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I did that special for you. I put it in here just at the last minute. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and we, because at car schools, remember car school, a four room schoolhouse that we went to. Um, and we walked there and back every day, uphill both ways. And we would, take the little ink thing, remember the desk was all carved with people's names, but there was a little inkwell hole on the right hand side. And they gave you India ink that you could spill all over yourself, which was marvelous. Um, and we'd bring that home and we'd do our drawings. And I look at this, this is one of my masterpieces of say age seven. Um, and I look at it now, of course it's terrible, but I teach art now. And I realized that the hand-eye coordination was going on pretty good at that point because the left-hand side of the boat and the right-hand side of the boat, without virtue of anything but eyeball, are pretty much the same. And uh, so anyway, we, both Chuck and I were developing some real, some real skill. But we knew if we were going to be Nat Harrishoff and put him in his place, that we would have to do two more things. We'd have to learn how to race a boat, and we'd not have to learn how to build a boat. We'd have to know how they were built. But did I say that I was lucky? Oh yeah, I did. Um, my grandfather uh, had access because he was a very good friend with Charlie Wharton who ran Wharton Shipyard, the biggest shipyard on the island. And he could get us in there and he would come and pick us up in his big old fat green Ford pickup truck with, with Arthur S. Clark plumbing and heating and gold leaf on both sides. And he was proud as a peacock, of course, to have his two boy grandchildren. I don't know what would have happened if we were girls, because he was a man's man, was Arthur S. Clark. But he'd take us down to the shipyard to Wharton's and he'd say, he'd let us in. And he'd say, boys, I've got business with Charlie Wharton. And you know what you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to be quiet. You can't disturb these men. And you've got to um, keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. And he'd then, he would walk up the stairs to where the office was and he'd light a cheroot because everyone smoked huge back then. And then he'd reach into his chest pocket and he'd pull out his flask. And of course we knew what was happening. He was gonna go in there and have a gam and a dram with old Charlie Watton. And in the meantime, the big Azorian fishermen and boat builders who were building this big trawler would tell us, you boys, you do what your grampy said and you stay out of our way. But you can, if you want to, you can snap off bungs and you can go over there on the cedar pile and you can pull the back off the cedar and you're gonna love the smell. So anyway, we, we grew up with boat building and we hung around there long enough to pretty much understand how a boat was put together. And in addition to loving yacht design, we both loved the whole idea of boat building. Well, then a terrible thing happened. When we were about eight years old, eight and a half, um, the parents said, we're leaving Jamestown. Of course, when we came to Jamestown, it was only gonna be for a year, but then my dad had trouble finding work. And you know, one thing led to another, we ended up having eight marvelous years on Paradise Island, Jamestown, Rhode Island, but we had to leave. So we left the shack and I, you know, I'd go back there in a minute, that place was, I can still smell it. It was, it was paradise on earth. And my parents ended up somehow buying a nice house in a plat, what they call a plat, uh, up in Warwick, Rhode Island. And uh, they did have a garage, that was a good thing, as will be proven later. Uh, but we, we were just despondent for a very short while until we realized we'd just gotten lucky again. And the way we realized it to start with was we always loved to work. We worked even on Jamestown. But when we 
landed here, we see all these houses around. They all had lawns. They had to be mowed. They, everyone got the paper. We got paper routes, both of us, big paper routes. We'd ride around on our bicycles and distribute the papers. And someone had to shovel the snow and so, someone had to rake the leaves. And we were in heaven. We created pain enterprises and uh, competed with it, each other to see who could earn the most money or do the most work in any case. And uh, it, it turned out okay. That part turned out okay. But maybe the most okay part was it turned out that in that neighborhood, um, there were several people who were members of the East Greenwich Yacht Club, which was six miles down the road. And of course, the word got out, just like it did on Jamestown, that you had these two kids. They were 14 years old. They'd never stepped foot in a sailboat. And they were just crazed about sailboats. Oh, isn't this a shame? And of course, we were wicked cute and hard working. So they, um, one at a time, they'd show up in our lives. There was one fellow that lived pretty much across the street, had a big old lawn. It was a $3 lawn. Both of us had to work on that one. And he was the uh, Commodore of the East Greenwich Yacht Club. And he was also the head of the power squadron where they taught people about piloting. Stuff. And he offered uh, to teach us, He'd come over every Monday night and he'd teach us the whole power squadron course for free. So we learned how to box the compass and we learned how to do time, speed and distance and what the bell boo, the, what all the boos were and all that. He, he, was, he was marvelous. Um, and then a fellow showed up in our lives. His name was Bill Berkey. He, we mowed his lawn too, but he was a good friend of our parents. They were socializers, which meant they all drunk, drank a lot together. Um, and he was a member of the East Greenwich Yacht Club too. And he, his wife was Ruth Berkey. And they, they didn't have any children. I don't think they could have children, uh, but they loved children and they particularly loved us and bill thought and i know what he thought he thought these kids had been dreaming about it having a boat or at least sailing a boat their whole lives and i think he had a talk with my mother in particular and said you know eleanor nelly you're not going to beat this these kids are not going to change they're they're going to want some boating in their lives this is the one thing all they do is work they don't have much fun they work 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 and they told me they're saving up to have a rowboat. These kids need to go. And so he said, he was proactive. He told my parents, I've signed them up for sailing lessons at the East Greenwich Yacht Club. And all they got to do is come up with six bucks a piece to join the junior yacht club. And you know, you can say no, but I've already paid. They're going or they're not going, but the money's gone. And so finally, my parents, in particular, my mother, relented. And, and you talk about someone doing one thing in their lives that makes the hugest difference for, for another person, for other person. That was it. That changed everything. It made leaving New, uh, Jamestown a whole lot better. And so we, we took sailing lessons at age 14 at the East Greenwich Yacht Club. And this is how it was. We spent the whole day out in the sun in bathing suits, in Blue Jay sailboats. They called them Blue Jays. They were um, 14 foot, 13 and a half foot, wooden boat, varnished masts, all varnished on the inside. They smelled nice. They were wooden boats. They had personality. I mean, look at this one up front here, a white one that's got pink polka dots on it. That was Carol Fitton's boat. And the one up behind it was called Tusitala, and Tusi Two was owned by Pamela Resch, and she was my first love. She might be listening tonight. So, um, we just, how could we not fall in love with these boats? We had also, we had read everything there was about boats. We knew about a beat, a reach, and a run, and spinnakers, and we probably knew the prismatic coefficient of a Blue Jay sailboat when the centerboard was pulled up and how much it changed when the centerboard went down. So we learned to sail real quick and we learned to race really quickly and we became quite adept at it. The way that the, and I gotta say, Blue Jays, 
nowadays you, you send your kid to sailing class and they put them in a white thing that comes out of a factory. It's always, it's got a blue deck. Why even put a name on it? The thing has got no soul at all. But wooden boats like these Blue Jays were loaded with soul. The names meant something. The history of the whole family was vested in this boat. The way they came about was that, that uh, a yacht club, this is Southport Yacht Club in this picture, the parents would all decide they needed some kids, things for their kids. The baby boom was blasting, so they're having all these kids and they all had to learn how to sail. And so the parents would get together, they'd buy a, a McKeon kit or a Saybrook kit or a Lippincott kit, and they'd build these boats in their garage. And, and then my brother and I couldn't, we couldn't stand it. We almost couldn't live without having a blue jay. And my brother credits me, well, Chuck, are you on here? If, if, if I you, think I am. I don't know. Am I on here? Are. You yeah, are. you're on. Go am ahead. I really? Yeah. So let me just quickly tell this part of the story. Um, so we'd fall, fallen in love with sailing and the Blue Jays and all the other kids were buying these kits and their parents were helping them build. Um, and my brother came up with this. It was entirely him that did this. But um, at the end of the season, he says, uh, look at all this money we got. And uh, well, we don't have enough money to buy a kit like that costs a lot of money. But he had it figured that we had enough money to buy the materials and the plans. You could buy the plans from Sparkman and Stevens for $50, I think it was, and they would issue a hull number. And then you could, in our case, because we could afford it, we, we went to our parents, especially my father, who'd like to keep his big car in the garage. And we said, hey, we want to build a boat. And we've been earning all this money, and we're going to do it, whether you say no or not. And very kindly, he said, OK, I'll leave my car out in the snow for the winter, and you kids can build a boat. But uh, it was uh, so basically, we took the money from the paper routes and all the other little enterprises we had going and we bought the materials and we built a boat from scratch and because we built it from scratch we named it scratch and there it is underway and uh and we were we found out that we were we had rudimentary tools we we had uh fixed our own bicycles we could fix most anything we were very good hand-eye coordination because of all the drawing stuff so, but we, we weren't quite sure we could do this, but it turned out we did. We bought the best of materials and we put it together. And then this day came when it was all done and we had to get it measured. We called the chief measurer down in Connecticut and he came up in his car and he said, you're gonna leave me alone in the garage. You can't coach me or anything else. I'm gonna do my thing. And we went inside the house and we were just as nervous as can be. We didn't. We didn't know, you know, we didn't know if we nailed this or not. And uh, he came in the house and he had a piece of paper in his hand. And he said, he shook his head and he came up to us and he said, boys, I've been in this business a long, words to this effect. I've been in this business of measuring a long time. You're about, you're about half the age of the next older person that ever built a boat. But I've looked your boat over really carefully and here you go. It's a legal Blue Jay. You can sail it in the national championship and you can put the numbers up on the sail. And <laughs> what a relief. And we went and, uh, and, we, and we built it perfect. We knew from reading the magazines that you're not going to win races unless the boat is perfect. And we had 16 coats of paint on one side. We'd flip it up and put 16 coats on the other side. Woolsey Corlox varnish. And the thing was beautiful. And, and it was... It, maybe it was a little faster than the other boats because it was so well built, but uh, that may not have mattered because my brother and I had really learned how to sail and race very well to the point where adults were asking us to race all the time with them. And we worked out, you know, we were really buff for our size. We were kind of small, but we were very strong. And we sailed that boat in, I think, 120 races. And we certainly won more than 100 of them. And the boat had quite a reputation. We, we had quite a reputation, a reputation. We had a big reputation in the state of Rhode Island for art already as kind of like art prodigies. Although the people didn't know we couldn't draw anything besides a boat. Um, 
but we got a good reputation as sailboat racers. And, uh, and then we went to college and that was fortunate too. Neither of us was certain that we were gonna go to college for various reasons, but my brother aced the SAT, got one question wrong. So he got a full scholarship to Brown and uh, I was never that competitive in school. Uh, but I also was looking at Fort Dix because we'd both taken the physical and like, Chuck didn't pass the elective service physical, but I was a prime specimen. And I really wanted to, I wanted to uh, live and uh, have a, a few more years. And they came up with this idea of a deferment. So I went down to University of Rhode Island and they said, yeah, you can come in. Greatest thing that ever happened. It was a great school for me for many, many reasons. Well, one is I had to pay for it myself. And we made enough profit off the Blue Jay because it had such a reputation that the first two years of college tuition, I paid with what my share of what I, we got out of scratch when we sold it. Um, and, and we were just so good. We just were so good that we be, both became intercollegiate All-Americans. And uh, in the junior year at URI, uh, we sailed, I sailed for the Holy Grail of intercollegiate sailing and, uh, and won it, the, the North American Championships, by the biggest margin in history up until that point. And so uh, Olympic people came around and showed interest in us, both me and Chuck, because he was very good too, and picked us to go to England on a, this sailing team and spend the whole summer in England. We'd never been overseas of us. We hadn't been far, um, but they sent us overseas and we beat up unmercifully on the Brits, um, but we loved them too but we beat them pretty bad. And uh, so anyway, the, the college career worked out great for, for both of us. As I say, I was really, really good in small boats. And my next move was to bigger boats uh, because I, I, I got drafted, <laughs> and, uh, but I got myself up to Great Lakes Naval Tra Training Center before I had to go to Fort Dix and the rule said that made you a Navy man. And so I went in as an enlisted man and I spent a year as an enlisted man. And then I put in for officer candidate school and I got into that and ended up an officer right during the, the Vietnam War. And, and um, I, as I've said, I've been really lucky. I was lucky. I had some close calls uh, on the ship, but uh, everything worked out just fine. But I was very lucky that in addition to having my normal officer duties as a weapons division officer and a many, great many collateral duties, they could have given me watch standing duties anywhere on that ship, but they gave me watch standing duties on the bridge of the ship. And I, I gotta say, I've never forgotten it. It was marvelous. Uh, in the middle of the night in the South China Sea, there would be three officers up there conning that ship and two of them were my age, 22 years old, and the officer of the deck, I was like junior officer of the deck, but the officer of the deck was maybe 26 years old. And there's 5,000 people down below there sleeping or doing their duty, and we're responsible for all of them. It, it was magnificent. I've never forgotten the Navy. The good parts of the Navy were pretty great. The bad part, oh, it, oh yeah, even I can look fairly good. Uh, in dress white uniform. Although I look at this picture now and all I can see is the wetness behind the ears. But anyway, I survived it. After the Navy, uh, the, the first thing I wanted to do um, was get a Volkswagen bus. And I did, and I put a pot-bellied stove in it and chimney out the top. And I cruised all around the United States for a while because I had a whole lot of unexpected, unexpended leave time. Uh, when you go overseas, there isn't much place to, to go on leave. So I spent it all on the bus and I got into building kayaks. That, I, had, I had to do something with boats. And uh, I got into the sport of kayaking and I built a whole bunch of kayaks. And from that, I learned about stressed skin construction. And I kind of kept that under my hat. And then I did a bunch of captaining and um, kind of went from one thing to another. and. I met a guy, a fellow hired me to teach his children and himself how to sail. He was a fellow down on Chappaquiddick Island. 
he was the guy who started CVS stores and owned con consumer value stores. And uh, I went down there and did the job all summer long. We, I became like family with him. And at the end of the summer, he was very appreciative of what I'd done. And he probably gave me a bonus, I don't even remember. But he did say, you know, I can tell that you're not a guy who ever had a great amount of opportunity in your life. But if you ever want it, and if you ever come up with an idea or a dream, call me. It didn't happen right away, but eventually I got the idea that if I'm going to be a yacht designer, it's time. And so I actually took some of the technology of, of a kayak and I thought about applying it to a sailboat. Now, right at this time, there were a lot of yacht designers breaking into the yacht design field, young ones, who, who would build one boat and that it would go viral. If they succeeded with it, they were right there. They, they were yacht designers like Ron Holland and, and, and Bruce Kirby with the San Juan 24 and Doug Peterson with Gan Bear and Bob Evelyn, Julian Everett over in England with Wavelength, Johnstone. They put one boat in their garage and it gave them everything they ever wanted. My brother did it with a Francis 26. Uh, so anyway, I figured it was time to design a boat. So I came up with this thing. It was a quarter tonner, quarter ton racing yacht. And uh, it didn't, it was a very unusual boat and it was pretty successful. We built six, five or six of them. And then the Olympic committee was always in touch with me about other stuff. And they said they were gonna get rid of the star boat, two man keel boat and they, wanted to replace it with something. And could I come up with something? I said, well, maybe. So the next boat I did was a very unusual boat. Um, it had a huge heavy keel and everything else was very light. And in order to make it work, I put a chassis inside of it and I called it the Payne Monomoran. And it was pretty, I didn't get it done, unfortunately, before the Olympic Committee had to decide on the next boat. I think they made a mistake. Anyway, then I moved to Maine. And I moved, and just like everyone that moved to Maine, I thought I'd landed in heaven. It was very much like Jamestown. And I helped my brother build his first Francis 26. And, uh, and then I built another Francis 26 with a guy who wanted me to do a little design work and, and we built it. And then he disappeared. And I went down to the Virgin Islands, took a job down there, which I love. And he came sailing to the harbor one day and he, he said he wanted to talk to me. And he took me to the bar next to, the, next to where I was working. And he said, I've got this idea. I've got some money now. I wanna sail ar alone around the world in a single-handed boat in the BOC race around the world, very famous boat race. And he, would you design the boat? And I, long story short is I did. And I built this boat, not only designed it, but he and I and five or six other people built it. Walter Green did the haul down in Yarmouth. And it was a very pretty boat, real fast. I mean, if I ever hit the lottery, I'm gonna build one for myself. It was called Air Force. And he took off in the race and uh, everything was going fine, but three days out, for some reason, he said he came down on something off a wave and hit something right in the wrong place where the major bulkhead was. The thing was all divided up into airtight compartments, but he hit it just the wrong place. And the boat slowly sank. He was rescued. In fact, when the helicopter took him off and the freighter left that was standing by, the boat was still afloat, but ultimately it sank. So at that point, I went to work for my brother as a boat designer. I never regretted it. It was just as much fun working for him as it was stress and anxiety working for me. Then, uh, this magazine came along. A friend of mine started a magazine, Main Boats, Homes and Harbors. And I got into my journalistic thing. I, I always liked everything about boats, including writing about them. So I wrote it for 33 years, I've written for this magazine and I'm still doing it. And uh, eventually I knew the people at Wooden Boat real well too. And I wanted to go down to this regatta in the Bahamas I'd heard about. and. They said, yeah, go ahead. If you get anything good, we'll maybe put an article in there. And I did that. And I've been going to that regatta 
for some 30 years. And one of the, the things that causes me to love it is the boats themselves. These people don't use li lines plans. They don't use a planimeter. They wouldn't know how to say planimeter. I, I even stumble over it myself. Um, the boats they have down there are beautiful. And I've become really involved in that regatta and have become a judge. And, um, and I'm writing a book. My wife, Carrie, and I are writing a book about the whole history of that regatta. Oh, yeah. And then I started, I've always been an artist. And so, so I started doing a lot of marine painting, concentrating on the boats that race in that regatta. And they do sell pretty well. For a while, I built these Kotuit skiffs. In the wintertime, I had a captain's job in the summertime, but I got into building these Kotuit skiffs, West System, and uh, they did real well. Got her on the cover of Sailing Magazine. And at a certain point in my life, I was always welcome to either become the tactician and main sheet man on, on a big boat or skipper the boat or at least sail it. And, you know, I sailed on magnificent boats like this boat, Goshawk, that was designed by Stevens and Waring right there in Belfast, Maine. And, you know, you, nowadays I just have to pinch myself. I have to think, my mother was right about almost everything. She, she was a wonderful, kind, marvelous woman, woman, but she was dead wrong about saying you'll never ever get aboard a yacht because I've been on all kinds of yachts. Sailed a 167 foot yacht from here to Savannah and out to Bermuda and I'm always welcome on a yacht. So anyway, I was up in Maine, I didn't own a boat and the boat that people used around here was called, well, there were two of them. It was a big 33 footer that I really couldn't afford, but then there were a whole bunch of little looters, 16s, beautiful, beautiful boats. And I wanted one for quite a while. And eventually I found one and it, it was a total wreck. Uh, I had to rebuild it um, and, uh, and I did. And the day that I bought it, I came home and I told my wife, I finally found a looters. And she said, oh, okay, great. Always wanted one. And I said, the trouble is, I just don't know what to name it. And she turned right around and she said, ludicrous. So anyway, I ended up calling it ludicrous. And in keeping with, of course, the ludicrous theme, when I launched it, I had my whole family decked out in clown suits that I bought on the internet. And I launched it right down at the foot of the hill here where I live, overlooking Bass Harbor, where all the fishermen are on the town dock. And they were all taking pictures with their cell phones of all these clowns. What are these clowns doing? <laughs> They're launching the boat. Anyway, I really got into the looters thing. That's my boat. And I really wanted it to look like a wooden boat because I think wooden boats are prettier. Half of the looters is our fiberglass and half of them are, are wood. I wanted mine to look like wood. So I put these wooden things, king planks down the middle of the deck and I painted the whale so it looked like wood. And as a final thing, the beautiful, as you will see in the movie, it's coming right up. The cabins were hot molded out of mahogany. And what I did was, because I was an artist, I faux painted that cabin to make it look like wood. And win or lose, and we do win a lot, <laughs> we got the prettiest boat in the fleet. So anyway, a theme of this story, I hope, that you're getting is luck. I was very, very, very lucky. But also, it was only due to the kindness of other people many, many, many times. Now, I haven't even mentioned him. I mentioned Bill Berkey. I mentioned Mr. Northrop. There was another guy, Chick Street, who was a commodore of the East Greenwich Yacht Club. He gave us yacht design lessons in the evening for free, uh, one evening a week for a long time. We went right through Skeen's Elements of Yacht Design, and he had a planimeter. It was so much fun. We use this planimeter. Um, so I wanted to give back to, and I didn't have a crew. My wife doesn't sail. And you need a good crew in order to win. And I do, do like to win. It's a weakness. Uh, so I took on this thing of what we call mentoring around here. And I went down to the sailing center and I asked him, who's the best sailor you got here teaching? And uh, you think they'd want to, uh, learn from a guy who thinks he knows a whole lot about sailboat racing and yes yes they would so he allowed him to take one day of the week off to sail on ludicrous and i've been through seven or eight of them one girl and seven boys i think a couple of them including this kid who's sailing my boat right now 
they could make it into the Olympics. These people have caught on. They're just, they're just really, really great at it. So I, and I love that part. I, I just love, that. last August, I didn't even say, oh my God, I just gave it to the kids. And I went out there like a coach and watched them and critiqued them, and emailed them and told them what they did right, what they did wrong. So I've been working at boat yards all around the island and on other out, outlying islands. Loved it. I love working on boats um, almost as much as designing them. And then I found I didn't like commuting out to the island because you wasted three hours a day before you even hit the time clock. So I found a place on the island where there's a fellow that named Jim Elk, and he does a lot of the restoring of looters class sailboats. And he kind of needed someone who was a hotshot who could set the boats up so they could go faster and faster. And I could definitely do that. And so he and I have been working together for the past four years. And I love working there. I love the guy. Everything about working there is just, is just great. And uh, that's his shop. There's a couple of looters in there. And we take them right apart. We take the keels off, the wooden ones, and we put new veneers on and we make, we make them like new. And one day, a fellow that had just bought one of the wooden ones came in and he said he was a videographer and he, he did videos of all of the space shots, the NASA space shots. And he said he'd like to do some time-lapse photography and make a movie about us restoring a classic looters. And that's what you're gonna see now. And it's a whole lot better than my show. So if I can make the technology work, you'll be seeing it here in a second. And thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay, now, now what do I do? I hit that first mm -hmm. and then I hit this and hopefully it'll work. Please work. Well, the looters, the L-16, the looters 16 is a 27 foot one design racing boat is named after the company that, that builds it. I mean, there were fleets all over the country. Chicago had a big one, San Diego had a big one. I'm sure Fisher's Island had one. So now the looters fleet in, in Northeast Harbor is the biggest one in the country, I'm sure in the world. The Northeast Harbor fleet ordered uh, 20 boats from the looters company and they were delivered in the late 1940s. And most of them have stayed around in the area. We've repaired probably seven of them here. I have, there's five of them in the shop right here. But the Looters built boat building company dated back to the early 1900s. It was in Stamford, Connecticut. The Build Looters was a, a wonderful builder and a designer. They built 200 of them. They're classic. Their their looks are just classic with the with the molded cutty and but they're also they're real easy to sail. They're they handle real easily. They um, they're real responsive. They were built using five layers of eighth inch mahogany veneers that are uh, cross laid on a mold to basically create plywood in the shape of a boat. So there are no frames inside this boat. The, the hull with these five layers and glued together is so strong and light and the glue seams are like perfect. When you go from one layer to the other, the, the glue joints inside are like perfect. The first looter, the first L-16 that was built was not built like this. It was a regular traditional plank on frame boat. I think the design um, and the boat was commissioned by the Fishers Island Yacht Club or something down Long Island Sound, but it wasn't too long before they started building them like this. So the only way to save these old boats is to, is to repair the bad wood, and it's almost all right in that section. Replace all the rotten wood with good new veneers and then the fiberglass over the, over the top so that water cannot get into the veneers. This boat is in pretty good shape, but we still had to remove one layer of the veneers. So I took a power plane and planed off an eighth of an inch down into the next layer, which you can easily see because the direction of the grain changes. 
I couldn't find the veneers I needed for this one, so I made them. I actually milled them out. So the interior of this boat was in such good shape that I decided to use a vacuum bag to apply pressure during the gluing process. So we used plastic staples just to hold the veneers in place, a few screws along the bottom where the bend was really tight, and then the vacuum bag was going to apply the pressure to hold the veneers down in the glue. So the vacuum bag goes over the entire boat and seals along the butyl strip that we put on and then you suck the air out with vacuum pumps. I was happy to see the vacuum gauge go up to 10 pounds per square inch of pressure, certainly enough to hold these veneers in place. Once we took the vacuum bag off, the hull was perfectly fair, except for where we had to scarf the new veneers into the old veneers. They kind of overlapped there, so we had to take a hand plane and a power plane to plane along that edge until that original shape is restored. Lay along here. I put it in, no, that's pretty good. The goal when you repaired all the bad veneers is to fiberglass right over the top of the boat because if you don't keep the water out of the veneers then they're gonna they're gonna rot again it's the only way to to, to repair them properly once the fiberglass cures then we hand sanded the the fiberglass with long boards then we add epoxy putty with micro balloons and sand again. It's a long process of fairing a hull like this, but it needs to be done because the, this boat's gonna be all gripped and if there's any imperfections in the hull, it'll show up in the really shiny paint that we're gonna put on. This part of the boat is done. It's all fared and um, ready to go back onto the keel. So it's on a trailer underneath there. It's on a little boat trailer. So we'll pull that over here underneath my, my hoist and um, pick it up, flip it over. Once it's high enough, we back the trailer underneath it that's already got the keel all set up with the bolts sticking out of it. So we just drop the boat onto the keel. This boat, unlike a lot of them I worked on, the the, uh, the cabin, the cuddy, the combings, the seats, everything is in beautiful shape. So I think the, all, the only thing we have to do once we get it upright above the deck is to redo the varnish, sand and paint, and put another coat of varnish on. Also on this boat, even though it hasn't been in the water for probably 10 years, the the mast was stored up um, in the rafters of a building and it's in perfect shape and um, I think all the rigging is, is good to go. It gets stuck when it's in the upright position. It gets stuck so we have to pull it over with two by fours and strength. Look at that. So much for the two by four. What the hell? That's only happened twice. <laughs> and, uh, and all no! Of I've done. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, you don't say that on film. Theoretically, it should work <laughs> like that. Every time. Yeah. But it never does. Well, it did. <laughs> so there's three new keel bolts, and then three of the original ones were, were in good shape. So we reused them. Once the boat is joined to the keel again, it's ready for the painting process. The uh, Below the water line, we put two or three layers of inner protect, and then the bottom paint, and then above the water line, it'll start the all grip priming yeah. and finish paint process. This boat has a really unusual deck where it's painted white with black stripes to kind of mimic a teak, teak deck, and um, so we have to redo that.
I mean, the funny thing about this is even though we only did one layer, I mean, you still have to do everything else that you have to do on all the other ones that are in bad shape. We, we had to take out all the screws along the backbone because they were all corroded, 70 years old. So even though this boat was in really good shape, there still was a lot of work that went into it to keep it going for another 100 years. Torches coming down the mountain And a kiss by the lake Cruising on dragonfly And on the tiller Sails in the sky Open wind comes our way a little bow rocks and sways Cause you light up my day You light up my day You light up my day Sunshine, you light up my day Yes, yeah, Walking down the fire On our way to Seal Cove Watching the ships from the shore The moon is curved like a thorn I feel your love in my bones When I'm with you, I'm at home Cause you light up my day You light up my day You light up my day Sunshine, you light up my day Go wherever you go. Look at all those people. <laughs> can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Oops, the movie's playing again. I knew there'd be a glitch. Here. Well, I the Lunar 16, the Lunar 16 is a 27 Hello? foot one design racing boat, is named after the okay, yeah. company that, that builds it. Yeah. Okay, but have I screwed up? Yes. No, you're good, okay. Art. You're good. Oh, yeah. you're Art, there's, you're better than good. Um, there are a few chats, but I. Well, do you want to say something, and then I might say something. I want other people to say things. I'm all set out. Okay, that was just amazing, Art. And you know what, everybody, we have just like skimmed the surface. 
a few summers ago, I mean, Mickey does this really, but I go scouting out sometimes, maybe two, three summers ago, I went down to the Camden Yacht Club. Whoa, it was a beautiful evening, an interloper, and they had a presentation with Art and Chuck. I like to rename things, so I'm not sure if it was two different strokes or identical strokes, whatever. It was in person, they were absolutely seamless. The two brothers presenting their art and that was a whole different presentation than what we just saw today. And it was, and maybe we ought to do that another time. And I mean, it was, it was, um, it was great. And it was seamless because I had this sense that I was in the presence of two storytellers who like to talk at length. So it was great, but I, I'm going to read the chats in a moment, but I had, um, oh, maybe one or two questions. One was, since you've admitted that you're very competitive, so which one was taking the picture and which one was the buffed youth in the white trunks on your Blue Jay named Scratch? Well, I was always crazy about photography. So I was the one that always owned a camera. I mean, as you may well know, I don't spend a whole lot for my automobiles, never spent more than 3000 for a car in my entire life. But I often drive around in my $1,900 car with $10,000 worth of camera in the back seat. And the, the locks don't work, so please don't spread that around. Um, I've always been crazy about photography. So it was me taking the pictures always and Chuck doing the sailing. Okay, okay. And, um, uh, you know, you, you went on to the short cardboard, but what I sort of remembered at that Camden presentation was um, a short cardboard, what I think of the, the, the short cardboards that come in stir, uh, starch shirts from dry cleaners. And I thought, what you and the picture that I thought you showed you were much younger or you know like maybe a four or five year old drawing and that you said people on Jamestown and this was your term that they sort of saw the two of you as artist savants and they would drop off the shirt cardboards and uh drawing and painting materials but I'm not sure that's that's accurate but that's that's my story well, um it's a great story it is inaccurate but you really tell a great story <laughs> If you want the real story, it'll take a minute though. I'm up for it. Okay, so maybe once a week, my mother would go over on the boat. That's what we call the ferries, the boat. You go over on the nine o'clock boat to Newport with my father's laundry um, shirts. And she would, once she was in Newport, she'd walk across Thames Street and up the hill to load it laundry. And she did this, you know, again and again. And my mother, you have to understand, was not only a marvelous, beautiful, kind woman, she was very small, petite, and very shapely, very likable. And I think that the owner of Loaded Laundry uh, was a bit smitten with her. And so she came in one day, she told me all this, and she said that her boys, her children, uh, did their drawings on shirt cardboards. And of course, the proprietor immediately went out in the back and he, he just muckled onto a huge pile of shirt cardboards and gave them to her with Mrs. Payne with my compliments. So anyway, every time that she went over to Newport on the ferry boat, Chuck and I expected and hoped that she would bring some small gift with her and we'd come to expect that. And so one day she came back with about 20 shirt cardboards and she had stopped at a stationery store and bought two packages of pedigree number two soft pencils and you know it's all relative in life she could have bought me a cadillac and it wouldn't have meant more than her buying the getting those shirt cardboards for us it meant a lot that's great should i read some of the chat questions um art why sure okay um all right. So um, James Kane asked, "Do you do you dry sail? Do you dry sail ludicrous?" Nope. We keep all the boats in the water, <clears throat> and I clean the bottom on my. I am a bottom Nazi. I tell my kids that I mentor that they have to be bottom Nazis because it's very important to have a clean bottom. I actually use two different types of bottom paint on my boat. I use Vivid for the major part because it's white and it's really pretty. And I use VC-17 on the keel because, of course, that's the, the hydrodynamic lifting surface. And I wet sand it to about 1,500 grit. It's pretty slick. 
Okay, and um, and I'll let you answer uh, Linda's question, but I just want to remind Linda and everybody else, Art named this presentation, and it was on that first screen of the beautiful like schooner or something. He called this presentation, quote, boats light up my day, quote. So Linda is wondering, what's the song and the singer that's playing during the video? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> the, 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 the guy who did the video is Leif Heimboldt. And his brother did the song. His brother, I think of as Peter Heimboldt, but he goes by a stage name of Peter Francis. And he was the lead singer in the rock band Dispatch uh, from Burlington, Vermont. And, uh, and I just, I love that song. It's why I named my talk, Boats Light Up My Day, in order to kind of keep in keeping with that song. And didn't you love the song? He did just such a beautiful job on that song. Yeah. Um, so I, because I don't know if, if um, Art can see any of this. So then what's the song? Um, oh, um, and then Martha, your sister-in-law said, I really enjoyed your talk. Art, love the photos and the stories. You are one super talented guy and a great brother-in-law. Love sailing Bonanza jelly bean with you. That's from Martha. Oh. That's from Martha. That, that's very nice. Yeah. One of the two bits boats that I built, I, you know, I built a bunch of them and I always tried to keep one for myself as a demonstrator. And I had read this novel. What the heck was the name of the novel? Anyway, Bonanza Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean was a name of a woman in that novel. And the boat was sort of shaped like a bean. So anyway, I named it Bonanza Jelly Bean. And we all had so much fun in that boat. Yeah. Well, I, maybe you'll be able to see some of these yourself later, but there are almost too many to count who say how much they love the story and what a great, uh, storyteller you are and they love the presentation and one person Nancy said she couldn't stop grinning and that's sort of how I felt too and many others um you know kept saying and then so Kevin asked how is it that you are ha you're having hanging knees in your home oh that you know I could tell stories all night in fact anyone who wants to talk to me I'm lonely as heck I'm a twin without my twin brother I have the world's best wife but it's not enough, enough during COVID. So anyone who wants to ask questions or just talk, just email me artpain at gmail.com and I'll answer all of your questions. Uh, when I first moved to the island here, I, you know, I had the Volkswagen bus and I was actually living in the bus in the woods for a long while till the cops chased me out. And there was another hippie. I wasn't a hippie, it was anything but, but there was a hippie with another Volkswagen bus and he had gotten these knees out of the Southwest Harbor Boat company. Boating Company, a big warehouse down there, had huge, beautiful hackmatack knees. And I've always loved knees. Um, and then they took the, the building down. He bought those knees and I don't know how much he bought them for, but not much, but he was living with them in his Volkswagen bus and it got uncomfortable after a while. And so uh, I told him, I. I would pay him for those knees. And he came to me one day and said, I'm tired of living with these things. And he, uh, he, he asked a very steep price, $20 a piece. And there were five of them. So I paid him a hundred bucks. And of course, once I had the knees, I had to build a post and beam living room on my house. And that cost me about $10,000. So those, those knees were very costly, but they're beautiful. They're as good as any Hackmatack knees I've, I've ever seen. Great. So there's and there's there's more compliments along the way. But Win Fowler, he said, was the schooner on the cover one of your paintings? It wasn't. I only had one painting in the whole show, which means I'm not much of a yacht designer because yacht designers are self promoters first, and anything else. I'm a marine artist, but I, I luckily I my my work sells without a whole lot of self promotion. But I did have one painting in there but that one wasn't mine. I think that was the Schooner Yacht America and I don't actually know the name of the painter. Okay, and Carolyn asks, what type of wood is usually used to build a boat? Uh, well, there's all kinds, <laughs> but generally speaking, in the olden days, they were, most of them used oak for the ribs and cedar for the planking, or they would use oak and cedar and mahogany for the planking if they double planked it. But nowadays, Mahogany is more often used, although there's all different kinds of mahogany and it's getting hard to get. Um, and teak 
used to be used a lot uh, for adorning the boat, but it's very hard to get these days. It has to be plantation grown and it's, it's not so good. Um, but these days with epoxy glues that you can coat the boat with after you've built it, you can almost build it out of anything because the epoxy glue keeps the, the weather away from the wood. At, at Jim Elks, we mostly use mahogany. Okay, and uh, Doug Coffin is um, quoting, I think somebody, an author named Robbins, but anyhow, he just comments, even cowgirls get the blues. Right. Yeah, that's the name of the novel that I like so much. Oh, yeah. Out yeah. of which came Bonanza Jelly Bean. Yeah, he reminded me. Thank uh, Douglas. <laughs> I was struggling to remember that. Yeah, Sam? Uh-huh. So I don't know if Brent has anything to say. So I I don't know. That was just amazing. And that was so much fun and uh, uh, and really wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you have anything more to say or Brenda or Chuck. <laughs> it was just great. I'm sort of, I'm almost speechless. <laughs> No, I, I'm fine, Carol. I mean, that was great. Thank you so much, Art. If anybody wants to unmute themselves for any other comments, Mickey, you just unmuted yourself. Do you want to say anything? Um, that was really great. And I can't wait till we can meet again in person in the Abbott Room of the Library and have a real program live, so. Thanks, Art. Great to see oh, you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. And I'm not even sure who, that, that wasn't. That sounds like Sam. Oh, was that Sam? That was me, uh, Win Fowler. Hi. Oh, Win, yes. Oh, we've <laughs> raced against each other a few times. Yes, we have. Uh, he's one of the fellows in Maine who can beat me bad. <laughs> can I say something? Can you see me? No. No, nobody. We, I can't. We can. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mickey. Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. So, so um, Art is one of Sam's bestest and oldest and bestest friends. And so when I first met Art, he took me sailing on two bits, the boat that you saw in, this, in his talk. And, um, and I had my two tiny kids on board with me. You scared her to death. And, and we're sailing around Bass Harbor and Art is like, he is the most incredible sailor I have ever, ever been around. And he, he sailed us around that harbor and he sailed us over to the ferry, close to the ferry in Bass Harbor, full of people about to go out to, was it Swan's Island or where, where was the ferry going? To? Swan's Island, yeah. Right. And he basically sailed that boat up to, to the ferry, like within a foot. And everybody on the ferry is like jumping overboard or like ducking and, and I'm ducking and I was like, ah, what the hell are you doing? And he, and he puts her about and he like, you know, and everybody's like, um, it, it's, it, the, he maneuvered that boat in such a way that I have never seen, you know, it was like an, an, a really memorable experience. And, um, and I wasn't quite too sure about this, friend that I had just met from my my you know <laughs> new partner but now I've been out on ludicrous with him and ludicrous is like the sh you know faster than shit the one of the best sailboats out there in northeast harbor and it's a real honor to go sailing with you and it's just glorious to see how you throw that boat around you win all the races and I'm so proud to know you and I just am thrilled <laughs> Thank you so, so much for coming tonight and presenting and telling us about how you grew up in, with boats and this whole story. It was really much more than I ever experienced. I thought we were just gonna see one little film that this was great. Thank you very, very much. Well, if you go- Brenda for hosting. If you've, got to, well, if you're gonna bore them, you wanna bore them to death. And of course, if Win Fowler is still, still on here, he will attest to the fact that a foot, a foot to an Olympic class sailor is like a mile. When when you when you're di dipping someone on port tack, you want to make it between a half inch and an inch because it tends to unnerve them a little bit. And the next time you come over on 
starboard, they're going to know that you're really, really good and you can slam dunk, dunk them and it, inti tim it intimidates them a little bit. It's the only way to race. Hey, Art. <laughs> Well, I, I, don't, I only feel safe when I'm when I'm on board with you. <laughs> Arthur, demoted. I can't believe that Bill Dinsmore from Aspen is calling me. Absolutely. Oh my God. <laughs> it's good I, to hear you. I've got goose flesh from thinking of all the years from our teenage years till now that I've enjoyed both of you guys and you did a great job. I. I, I miss you dearly being so many thousands of miles away, but um, it was, you were wonderful, both you guys. I love you both. Well, thanks, Bill. And keep my room warm because, you know, I'm starting to ski on an almost beginner intermediate level. And the so, heat's on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, make sure you got the aeration machine because, you know, I have to get acclimatized to the altitude. <laughs> okay. I'll be in that room one of these days when I this, look forward this gets to it. Open. So, so Art, I'm, I'm Scott Hess. I'm, I'm new to Maine. I was a, I lived out on Hatteras Island and decided it was too hot for me. So, but I, I, I wanted to thank you for your, your storytelling skills were amazing. And I have my, my two sons, one's a boat builder who builds wooden boats and he's building his boat right now. He was in Northport to sail around the world. My other son's a captain of uh, sailboats down in Baltimore area on the uh, Chesapeake. Um, and I, it's just was such a pleasure to listen to you and hear your stories and and uh, you know I'm a, I'm a sailor in remission right now but but, uh, <laughs> but you know it doesn't ever really go away so I'm hoping to be uh, grab a boat underneath me this spring and, and sail again but but beautiful stories thank you well thank you for for your comment and if you ever come up here I'm lonely as hell just stop right here in Bernard we'll go down to Thurston's and kill a few lobsters together. <laughs> It sounds perfect. It sounds perfect. Hey, Art, I'll go to Thurston's with you. Okay, fine. The more, the merrier. So you're getting a, you're getting a lot more compliments, and I have one comment, but Linda has one question. It's a big one. Where in Down East Maine, where would you sail? Where's one of the places to sail to day sail in Down East? Oh my God, it's you know I've sailed as as captain and not all over the world, but a whole lot of places. And Maine is the best. You know, I, I do, you know, you do like, I love the Bahamas. I like the Virgin Islands and Down Island, but, and I'd like to sail in the Philippines, but Maine, Maine's about as good as it gets. And, and I was a captain for the Hinckley Company for many, many years and took people out for week charters. And most of the time I would just leave Southwest Harbor and I would head West towards Belfast. And, you know, I wouldn't, go much further than Christmas Cove and before I turned around because between here and say Monhegan Island, between Bass Harbor and Monhegan Island, it's paradise. There's no end of beautiful places to go. There's some that I still haven't seen yet and I did this captaining for 20 years. I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> I think it helps. Um, you know, I just think uh, it's it's my bias that you just cannot have too many siblings since I have seven of them. But I gotta say, wow, you guys are so lucky to just each have, you only needed one, each other. And uh, what a pair. Oh no, that's, we are so supportive of each other. And you know, I have to say, well, I won't go get too personal here, but I don't know what I would have done without Chuck because both of us were born prematurely. Both of us had our own minor birth defects and we helped he helped me out tremendously in terms of mine tremendously i don't know where i would have been without chuck and i don't know if i helped him all that much but uh, well you so certainly helped me at at the, my boat design company um art was art is an incredible artist in any medium and um what he did at at my boat design company was he would do the preliminary sketches always in color often with a, a blonde headed nude at the helm i mean he could really embellish and um and we sold a lot of designs because art did these beautiful renderings before you know i could just talk about it with art he read my mind anyway and um and then he could do the sketch and uh we'd send it off to the guy and the deposit check would come back 
Yeah, now we're both marine artists and, and we're doing pretty well at that too. <laughs> Chuck's really good at, at marine art. We both teach marine art and, and I, I, I learn and teach portraiture because I love to do portraiture as well. Uh, I had some portraits in here in order to do a little self-promotion, but the show was too long, so I couldn't show them. And it had nothing to do with boats. Thank anyway. But thank you, Chuck. That's very yeah. gracious of you. <laughs> well, I think we'll just have to meet again with both of you. And since it's eight o'clock, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And I think uh, Chuck and Art deserve to just have the last word. <laughs>